Hey there, it's time for the show The Tatiana Show Where you make friends and talk life and crypto This episode of The Tatiana Show has been brought to you by eToro.com. You can trade in a wide range of assets, connect with the crypto community, and automatically copy top-performing portfolios at eToro.com. Quite simply, they have the top currencies, smart tools, low fees, social trading, all in one simple app. They facilitate over $1 trillion in trading volume per year globally. eToro makes powerful trading tools easy. Get started in minutes right now at eToro.com. That's E-T-O-R-O.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tatiana Show. This is Tatiana Moroz broadcasting to you from Eleuthera in the Bahamas, beautiful island. We're doing a cool event here based around music and Bitcoin, which is really nice. I've got some good friends with me in from out of town participating in this, as well as Lisa Loud, who we just had on The Tatiana Show recently. Uh, and uh, we've got a music and video crew out here, so lots of fun. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm looking at the news, and uh, there's some kind of Iranian general that was bombed, and I don't know what I should feel about this because I'm not as informed as it could be. So what do I do? I decide to call, of course, king of uh, anti-war news, Scott Horton, who has been on this show before. Uh, Scott does incredible things um, in the name of uh, good journalism and spreading the message of liberty. He has uh, the Libertarian Institute as well. But uh, why don't we let him tell you guys a little bit about himself before we dive right in here. Thank you so much, Scott, for being on the show today. Hi, Tatiana. Good to talk to you again. Awesome. So fill me in with what's going on in the news right now. Now, we've been on the show before, talked about the Middle East, but there's some new developments. Uh, you also wrote a book about Afghanistan. So I definitely want to get to, you know, what are you thinking about what's going on over there? What is the current state of things? Because people, of course, think one thing of Trump and then all of a sudden they're paying attention to the war machine, whereas they should have been paying attention all along. Tell me, is this a big deal? What just happened? Should we be concerned? Is World War III imminent? Yes, it's a big deal. Yes, we should be concerned. And no, World War III is not imminent. Um, the fact of the matter is that because because of the way the chess pieces are set up in the Middle East right now, so to speak, the Americans cannot fight the Iranians and they cannot fight the Iranians' allies in Iraq, especially. They're just in no position to. And I'll elaborate a little bit about that. But essentially, we're at a stalemate. The Iranians know that in the event of a real war with the United States, our government could wipe their country off the map even without nukes. Our B 52s could carpet bomb their cities and probably would. If it came down to a real war, it would be an absolute Absolute catastrophe for their country. And they don't want that. At the same time, the American superpower is a little bit helpless because it's got itself tied down all over the Middle East. You see those funny maps that say, how come Iran, if they're not a threat, how come they put their country so close to all our military bases? And it shows all our military bases around the region. Well, in a sense, all those troops are hostages. In a way, it's good. In a way, it's like the Russians getting the atom bomb means now we can't fight them. Whereas before, we might have started a war. Um, in this case, it's mutually assured destruction. Our soldiers in Iraq, in Kuwait, in Bahrain and Qatar and Saudi and Oman and UAE, all up and down the West Bank of the Persian Gulf there, uh, are at risk, along with a gajillion dollars worth of economic targets. And so, and I left out our troops in Afghanistan who are also at risk, uh, just within missile range from Iran. And so it amounts to tens of thousands of Americans. I mean, at least thousands could die in the event of a real war. You would have at least th low thousands. Uh, maybe more. And the amount of assets at risk, you know, our fifth fleet, our fifth fleet is stationed at Bahrain and we have a giant air base in Qatar and other air bases. Um, you're talking about massive amounts of military equipment, which is all for keeping and not losing <laughs> on the tarmac to some missile strikes. So um, that's the good news is that that should mean that we're not going to fight them. It's the same reason George Bush didn't attack Iran back in 2007. The military told him, you know what we don't want to do? Fight Iran. Forget it, Mr. President. And so he said, okay, that's it. That's what happened. That's the history of the year 2007. The military crossed her arms and told the president, no, we don't want to. It's too much. And so whew. now the problem is this, Tatiana, is that in George Bush's war, 2003 through eight, pretty much, they stayed through 11, but the big fighting was over by the end of 08. Uh, and in that five-year war, they fought that whole war for Iran's friends, but they hate that. <laughs> they wish they hadn't done that. So um, then they tilted back towards the Sunni king. 
kings of Saudi Arabia. The Iranians are the Shiite uh, government there uh, in the revolution of 1979, kicked the Americans out and declared independence from our empire and installed this Shiite religious pseudo dictatorship, half assed republic kind of thing uh, that they have there. And so after Bush did this huge favor for them, they thought it would work out differently, essentially. Uh, you know, it, it ended up empowering their strategic adversary in the region, the Iranians. So then they decided to tilt back toward the Sunnis in Iraq, as well as toward anti-Iranian and anti-Shiite Sunni groups around the region, which meant really a bunch of bin Ladenite terrorists. In uh, Lebanon, there was a group, a few in Syria, and a really bad group in Iran, in southeastern Iran called Jandala, who were a bunch of bin Ladenite head choppers, suicide bomber, you know, nutballs. And the Americans and the Israelis are backing them against Iran. And this is the same explanation of why Obama supported the terrorists in Syria all those years. You mentioned how we talked about the Middle East before on the show. I think a lot of it was about the war in Syria, where it sounds crazy that the Sunni insurgency in Iraq, which was allied with a bunch of bin Ladenites, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, they were known as. the All the foreign fighters were the worst killers and war criminals of the Sunni side of that war. That Obama just turned around and took their side on the Syrian side of the line. And when they were led by Al-Qaeda type forces, were the most powerful and dominant faction among all all of them, unlike the war in Iraq, which is really much more of a nationalist uprising uh, and, and a Sunni resistance, but not a religious one, but just an identitarian one in a way. Whereas in Syria, the whole thing was led by a bunch of bin Ladenites. And why did Obama do that? To try to make up for the fact that Bush had given Iran's friends Baghdad. And so he thought, well, I'll take Damascus, the capital of Syria, away from them because the Baathist government in, in uh, Damascus was allies with uh, Iran. It used to be their only Arab ally. Now they've got two. Well, we gave them Baghdad. Let's take Damascus away. But the means to that end was encouraging the rise of the Islamic State. But then, Tatiana, I hope you got a map in your brain or in front of you about here's Iraq and here's Syria and where they all fit. The Islamic State had conquered all of eastern Syria. But instead of focusing on overthrowing Assad in in western Syria, they went east into western Iraq. And they conquered all of the predominantly Sunni western side of Iraq and declared the caliphate the Islamic State, and this guy Baghdadi up there like Mussolini on the balcony declaring himself the dictator and all of this stuff. So then they had to fight another war for the Shiites. Iraq War Three, where they again allied with the Baghdad government, its army, what was left of it, and its proxy Shiite militias. It's essentially its paramilitary groups that had joined up to all defeat the Islamic State, to destroy, you know, in other words, a bin Ladenite government that had taken over eastern Syria and western Iraq. And so America went back to war for the Shiite side again. This is all Obama's fault. He did it to himself and then he had to go and start with the correcting of the mistake. And that's the war that Trump finished in the first year of his presidency was the war to destroy the Islamic State. So the reason I tell you all this is to explain that the troops that we have in Iraq right now, they are there allied with these Shiite militias who, yes, are backed by Iran in order to fight ISIS, the bin Ladenites, the terrorists, what's left of the Islamic State insurgency in Western Iraq. So in other words, we have enough troops there to fight ISIS. We do not have enough troops to turn around and fight our friends, the super majority Shiite population of the country and the government that Bush installed in power there and all of the army and paramilitary groups that support it. You're talking about entirely undoing the results of Iraq War II, you know, and going back the other way. That's absolutely impossible. It's never going to happen. And there's nobody in D.C. who thinks that, yeah, that's what we should do is put another 300 thousand troops into Iraq and un, you know redo the sectarian cleansing of the capital city in the other direction and all this. There's just no way. So stalemate, you know, and, and what did America, we obviously gained nothing from any of this, but what do we have to lose if we leave? And the answer is nothing. If, you know, if the question is a, a matter of influence over the Baghdad government, what does our influence over the Baghdad government get us? Except a black hole to pour money in and, you know, maybe a connection for some corrupt arms dealers here in America who get to profit off of arming the Iraqi government. But what do the American people get out of it? Nothing. In fact, what does the American empire even get out of it? Really? Nothing. You know, uh, in Kurdistan, they do business with Exxon and all of that. You don't need an American military presence to guarantee that. You don't need an American military presence in Iraq at all. And people who say that, no, because when we left Iraq, that's what led to the rise.
rise of ISIS? No. Leaving Iraq didn't lead to the rise of ISIS. It left Iraq at the end of 2011. It was at the beginning of 2011 was when Obama started backing the Al-Qaeda insurgency on the other side of the border in Syria. And it was years of that. It took four years of Obama and allies backing these bin Ladenite terrorists before they were powerful enough to then invade and conquer Western Iraq. That's what gets the blame. Not Obama pulling out of Iraq. It's true that our troops weren't there to defend from the crisis he'd created, but the fault was in creating that crisis in Syria. Uh, whereas if America and our allies had stayed out, then the Syrian so-called civil war would have been over in 2011. It would have never been a war at all. And so, um, you know, I don't know if that's as clear as mud or what, but, you know, I'll say this. We have nothing to fight about with Iran. Our side is mad that we keep doing them these favors. We've made them more powerful in Iraq. We, the American government's policies, have made them more powerful in Iraq and more powerful in Syria. And those are just the breaks. That's how it is. You shouldn't have listened to the Bushes. Shouldn't have listened to the, not you, they, no one, should have listened to the Bushes or the Obamas and what they wanted to do here. And um, and they ruined everything. So then but, how uh, the does that The now is with- just to leave. There's nothing to fix. There's no loose ends to tie up even. This is a good pause point to just pull the hell out. So is it because that guy was killed that now we can leave because everybody there is pissed and wants America to leave? I mean, sorry to simplify it, but it's a little bit hard to follow. And, well, that and helps then, actually. It- yeah. I mean, in a way that just helped alienate America from the Iraqi government more. And the problem is America's government has a lot of money and a lot of weapons and the Iraqi government likes money and weapons. And so they will keep ties open and they'll probably allow America to stay in order to get their hands on that. That's what the Americans are betting, but they're not on our side. And the fact that America bombed an Iranian in Iraq and the Iraqi government took Iran's side immediately. They're, the headline on antiwar.com today is they're talking with the Russians about buying some anti-aircraft missiles, the S-300. I mean, <laughs> this is George W. Bush's war. This is the result of Iraq War II. Um, and now killing this guy. So by the way, I didn't really address that. This is the most, the second most powerful guy in Iran, essentially more powerful than their president, probably. Uh, you know, he's compared to like wow. their Ike Eisenhower or something, their most celebrated general ever who has, uh, you know, silver stars and what have you going back to the Iran-Iraq war when America backed Saddam Hussein against Iran in the 1980s. And, um, you know, he's an extremely influential guy in Iran. And for Trump to kill him was a huge escalation. And in fact, this all started on December 27th when there was a rocket attack on an American base that killed a contractor translator. And they just blamed it on this Shiite militia group. And then by the magical property of they claim, so this means that Iran Iran made this militia group do it, this Iraqi group do it. And so then they bombed the base of the group that they accused, which denied it. Uh, and there's no evidence that they really did it. Khatib Hezbollah, they're called. And they killed 25 people or so. And then that caused a big protest at the embassy, which was really a staged kind of an event. The cops let them get inside one outer gate in order to protest. But there was no real threat of a Benghazi type attack. All the State Department employees have been evacuated. They're nothing but fight Marines in the embassy at that point anyway. And, um, but still the cops essentially, because again, it's our allies we're bombing here. So the cops are on the side of the protesters, but only so much too, right? They're standing between us, but somebody spray painted on the wall that Soleimani is our commander, something like that. This is the Iranian general. And then I'm not sure if that was just, I guess that was just a pretext um, because we come to find out that he was actually on a peace mission. Donald Trump had encouraged, oh, no. Donald Trump had encouraged the Saudis or encourage the Iraqis to serve as intermediaries between the Saudis and the Iranians. Because when Trump didn't go to war with Iran last summer over the drone and ship bombings and all of that stuff and back down, the Saudis said, oh, well, geez, I guess, um, you know, uh, maybe we should go ahead and start talking to the Iranians. And Trump had encouraged the Iraqis to be intermediaries. So why was Soleimani in town? He was there, according to the Iraqi prime minister. He was there um, because the Saudis had sent a peace message to Iran and Iran was replying. And he was there to give Iran's reply to the Saudis, to the Iraqi prime minister, to pass on to them. And so I think we're running an article today on antiwar.com by Ted Snyder saying that there's a very real reason to believe that that was the motive, that America targeted and killed this guy because he was in the middle of trying to broker a detente in the massive sectarian war led by Tehran and Riyadh. Holy moly. I'm telling you, which as I think it was in Sheldon Richmond's article where he said just the level of dishonor that that adds to this horrible act of violence is just 
Olympic in scale. And this is an act of war. I mean, imagine if someone had assassinated, imagine if Iran had assassinated James Mattis or David Petraeus. And they're a couple of losers, right? What if they had actually won a bunch of wars? <laughs> like this guy Soleimani had, you know, uh, at least helped a bunch of underdogs resist foreign dominance, which by the way, he helped the Americans overthrow the Taliban and fight Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan in the first months of the terror war before Bush put Iran in the axis of evil and canceled all that. Um, but anyway. Wow. Uh, that's yeah. just crazy. So this is the kind Let of thing where, some... yeah, if somebody did well, that to us, our country would go to war immediately. And then, but we act like we have the impunity to do that kind of thing. And and the only thing that we're counting on to keep the peace essentially then is the cool patient wisdom of this 80 something year old Ayatollah who is thankfully not an emotional type. Wow. Let me ask you, why are there all of these protests going on in Iran? Because I've also heard that. And what have been the effects of the various sanctions? Well, that's, you just answered your first question with your second one, right? So America is waging a massive economic war against Iran for the purpose of destabilizing and destroying their government. And I think that this is real. It could lead to a real conflict. But what they say quite openly is that their policy is not regime change. It's not war and it's not a CIA coup either. They're trying to cause regime collapse. They're trying to, the same thing they tried to do with the Saddam Hussein government. We think the price is worth it. The famous quote of Madeleine Albright from the 1990s. That we're trying to strangle their economy, strangle the civilian population of the country into such desperation that it turns all of a sudden into a velvet revolution type situation like the fall of the Soviet Union in the end of the 80s, where support for the government just collapses and the thing just disintegrates, which is a model that's never worked. It wasn't American sanctions that brought down the Soviet Union. Uh, it was communism that did that and their overextension in Afghanistan. Very costly war. Um, but uh, they keep trying to do this and they're trying to do this in Yemen right now. They have the same policy of massive sanctions and economic blockade and a starvation campaign combined with real war. And that still doesn't cause the people to overthrow their government for getting them into this mess. Did the American people overthrow George W. Bush and throw Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton's wife, out of the Senate for the September 11th attack? Of course not. They all hoisted their American flags and rallied around their leader, just like anybody would do. And of course, there has been major you know, dissent against the clerical rule in there, and for good reason, for a very long time. It's hardly the majority of the country, I don't think. There are all kinds of reasons for people to have grievances against the government of Iran. But then America is the most useful prop for the mullahs, right? Because the mullahs get to say all this dissent is all sponsored by the CIA. And you can read it at, over at the Ron Paul Institute, you know, where they, where Dan McAdams shows you where the National Endowment for Democracy and the Soros groups and these other, you know, NGOs and all these groups actually help support the, you know, so-called liberals, um, the city folk in Tehran and others in their dissenting politics. And so then the powers in, you know, in charge get to exploit that and say that these people are all just foreign puppets, which is, you know, to a great degree true, even though they, you know, probably have plenty of real grievances. But just think about if, you know, you and I talking about uh, what we don't like about our government. If we were on the payroll of the Iranian intelligence services, uh, just what kind of discredit that that would bring, right? No one would listen to a word that we said. We'd be laughed right out everywhere, accused right out of everything. Um, and of course, the very same thing applies over there. And so, and then, you know, we saw this in 2009 where there was a contested election and, you know, I have real experts on both sides and I really don't know. I didn't do the work myself. It's really hard to tell whether the reformer types really won the election or not. They tried to do a color-coded type revolution out of it, the Green Revolution, and the government put it down and they killed at least a few hundred people, I think. And um, and recently, you know, there's been a massive protest movement. But then look what happens. America kills Soleimani. In fact, there's been a massive protest movement in Iraq too, and specifically against Iranian influence because they have plenty of problems with their own government. But then the Iranian special ops squads came out and started sniping people in the protest movement, which only drove it crazy, only made it bigger and bigger. And this was, you know, kind of a whole wave of anti-Iranian sentiment among the Iraqi Shia. In fact, there was an article about the Sunnis saying, we're staying out of this one. Don't call me ISIS, man. Leave me alone. You guys fight this out yourselves. 
themselves um, and prevent anyone from putting a sectarian spin on this thing. And it was between Shiite Iraqis and the Iranians. And then in the midst of all this, what does Trump do? He kills probably the most popular and influential Shiite leader in the world, uh, the head of the Iranian Quds Force, which then turned all of the sentiment among the Iraqi Shia right around from being anti-Iranian to being anti-American and back toward their alliance with Iran. They're fellow Shia and all that. And then same thing in Iran. I don't know if you saw the pictures, but they're famous worldwide of probably millions certainly high hundreds of thousands of people coming out for the various events at the funeral procession of this guy all across Iran. I mean, wow. the kind of numbers you've never seen replicated in America for any reason. That sounds and, like uh, an unbelievable blunder. I mean, it just sounds like massively stupid. What is going to be the impact of this? And what do you think Trump's election campaign, like how do you think that that will factor into decision making? Because this on the one hand, you know, it's getting a lot of press, but the the perspective that you just shared, I mean, it's just terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. I, I mean, we really just upset everybody in that region. I mean, the guy was on a peace mission, which just sounds like, holy cannoli, what the hell just happened? So what's going to happen now? And and what do people think of Trump? I mean, what about the troops? Are the Is the military there thinking this was a good idea? I mean, are, are they all drinking the Kool-Aid? What's happening? Sorry, I just gave mm -hmm. you 50 questions, but pick up yeah, one. No, that's okay. I mean, so the thing of it is, the Iranian response was to essentially deliberately miss or give advance warning that, hey, get all your troops out. We're going to target this and that base. There are no casualties. At least one of the missiles didn't even have a warhead on it and just crashed into the ground. And um, so then Trump, and this was obvious that night, thank goodness, Trump is not going to give a statement. He's going to bed. He's going to give us a statement tomorrow morning. And the B-52s are not in the air. That's it. And then Trump came out the next morning. And of course, the speech was full of a, a lot of bluster and a lot of ridiculous stuff. But he essentially said it's over. That, and the reason he killed Soleimani was really to get the last word. He wasn't trying to start a war. He was trying to, well, I don't know, maybe some in his administration really were trying to start a war. But I think his intention was to tell the Iranians, don't you mess with me. And I don't mean to buy the premise that uh, Khatib Hezbollah launched that rocket attack at Iranian behest at all. I probably think both of those things are false. Um, but I think Trump was probably told that and believed it and was trying to tell the Iranians, you know, don't mess with me. I'm a lot, you know, more dangerous than my predecessor, this kind of thing. And then I think the Iranians knew that. He's not trying to start a war with us as, as pissed off as they must have been over that assassination. They didn't feel like they had to escalate it into a conflict. So they got their lick in by launching these missiles. And then Trump took it and actually let them get the last word because it was more of a whisper. And so he said, okay, fine. And so right now it should be settling down. And the problem is this guy had a lot of loyal followers in Hezbollah and Lebanon, a lot of loyal followers among all different militia groups among the Shia in Iraq under varying degrees of central control. And the Iranian Ayatollah, as far as I know, is not satisfied. In fact, he said he's not satisfied with that, that this was a slap in the face, but it's not enough. And you know, at their choosing of time and place that they're going to find other ways to get revenge against the US. And their best revenge the smartest thing that they could do would be to use all their influence in the Iraqi government to insist that we leave. And the Iraqi parliament really did vote a resolution to force us out, although all the Sunni and Kurdish members of parliament boycotted it. I think it still would have passed anyway. But they only have a caretaker prime minister now who's been forced to resign during that protest movement we talked about a minute ago. Um, and they're you know figuring out who's going to be the next prime minister now. So that's not really being enforced, it doesn't look like. Um, but, you know, I don't know, man. I, honestly, people make very bad decisions in these kinds of situations sometimes. But I think it's a lot like the Cold War standoff when I was a kid. It's the same thing still where both sides really don't want war. Like in the case of Iraq, Iraq really didn't want war. America really wanted war. <laughs> You know, in this case, neither side wants war. You know, they, they have a lot, uh, you know, of outstanding uh, issues and whatever. Most of them American created, but uh, but they don't really well, have anything to fight about. Do you think that they realize that in a way their own positions are precarious? So the American side, you mean? So they're willing to put the place. Uh, but I mean, Iran, I mean, they don't need a whole big massive thing. So, I mean, just to keep the state power at all, I, I think they're they're willing to kind of let things slide. Um, I don't know. But so so what does this mean for the election? 
I mean, do you think that Trump is going to mm-hmm. keep going now? Like, what what happens now? Well, I think his calculation, as far as the election goes, is he wants to be tough, but without starting any new wars. He doesn't want to be accused of being weak for ending any either. And so, you know, he likes strutting around and being a pretend tough guy and all of this stuff. And so I would like to see that hurt him. I mean, the fact is, I don't know, people get really caught up in this stuff when they're getting really caught up in it. But over the next 11 months here, you know, I think people are really sick of the wars. I think there's enough of an anti-war movement growing up of veterans of these wars, especially, and Republicans at that. And, um, you know, I sure hope that they do everything they can to make their voices heard. Uh, There's great groups like bringourtroopshome.us and um, the types who would be happy to support Trump if he would follow through on what he said about ending the wars. And they don't like all this, you know, jingoistic uh, threatening other countries and whooping it up and all this stuff anymore. They're over all that. And uh, so it's up to the people of the country. It's up to the American right to change the narrative on Trump and let him understand that, you know, bring them home is not a chant of support and gratitude for all the bringing them home that he's done. He hasn't. It's a demand. It's an or else. And they have, you know, a great ability, I think, to get that through to him. Uh, Unfortunately, it really is a question of the people on one hand versus organized power on the other with entirely different agendas as far as these wars go. So it's a hell of a fight. But you know what? If Even just portraying it in that way, making it clear that the American rank and file Republican voters and conservative movement members no longer support this stuff is probably the most powerful thing that we can do is just changing those assumptions about American politics there. Because if the American right doesn't support this stuff anymore, who does? You know, the liberals will go along with it. They'll be quiet about it if it's Obama doing it. But that's not the same thing as truly supporting intervention and war, you know? Uh, I mean, do you think that he's going to win? I think he's going to. I do. Look at what losers the Democrats are. Who else is he going to go against? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what do you think? Oh, you know what? I remember what I wanted to ask you. You had made, uh, shared something on your Twitter about Tulsi Gabbard not really being so anti-war after all. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because a lot of people are really drinking the Tulsi Kool-Aid. I admit she seems, I like what she's saying a lot of times, some, some things anyway. Um, but you said that she wasn't really that anti-war. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, she's by far the best Democrat on this stuff. So I don't want to take everything away from her. And if people want, you know, I gave a talk at a Ron Paul event in November in uh, Lake Jackson there where propaganda in the 2020 campaign, something like that. And uh, that's, I talk about this and someone had taken a clip out of that, of the second half of what I said about it. The first half of what I said about her was more positive. Um, But the negative part, it's essentially like this. So remember a few minutes ago, I was talking about how Obama actually took the side of Al-Qaeda in Iraq in Syria. Well, that's true. That sounds like conspiracy theory stuff because of how horrible and crazy and insane it sounds. It is. It is outright treasonous. It is just completely nuts for them to hate Iran so much that they would back Al-Qaeda, not just after September 11th, but after Iraq War II, when they were the very worst part of the Sunni insurgency, suicide bombing Shiite pilgrim civilians by the hundreds and God knows what. I mean, it was really bad. So Tulsi Gabbard, she was in Iraq War II, which means that unlike all of the rest of the population of this country, she knows the shirts from the skins in the war. She can tell who's on whose side. And she's looking at Obama's Syria policy, essentially out of my same eyes, going, are you completely crazy? And then seeing that the answer is yes. And then, you know, she absolutely opposed it all along and rightfully so. And that's great. And better than that, uh, she's opposed the regime change wars, which, you know, include the war in Syria would go into that category. But if you look at the wars in, um, well, now the war in Libya was really outright on behalf of Al-Qaeda too. But the war in Iraq, now that really benefited Al-Qaeda. Bush's Iraq war too. Really benefited Al-Qaeda, but it wasn't meant to. You know, it was just America took the side of the Shia and it kind of pushed the Sunni insurgency into the arms of the bin Ladenite type. And their ranks were allowed to grow and Western Iraq became this horrible, lawless, wild west landscape where they could, you know, grow and train and recruit and and all these things. But that was a great example of a horrible unintended consequence of launching a regime change war. We shouldn't be backing secular dictators, but that doesn't mean we've got to overthrow them either. You know, so she's saying, you know, Iraq, Libya, Syria, I don't know if she mentioned Yemen. We should not be doing the, or Afghanistan for that matter. We should not be changing the governments in these countries. 
series. But what's left then? She's against taking their side and she's against these bait and switch wars where they sort of imply they're fighting terrorism and then they overthrow some secular dictator, something like that. That still leaves the war on terrorism. That still leaves actual wars against Al-Qaeda fighters. And we've seen, honestly, really only two of those. I guess maybe if you want to throw an Al-Shabaab in Somalia, that's a different conversation. But the two real examples of the terror wars in the 21st century, none of them take place in the Bush years, by the way. They're both in the Obama years, the CIA drone wars in Pakistan and in Yemen. But they were both horrible and they killed all these civilians and they only radicalized the local populations and made things worse. I think you could argue that in Pakistan, they really did kill the last few friends of bin Laden hiding out there among the Pakistani Taliban. But the Pakistani Taliban had never done anything to us. They're an entirely separate group from the Afghan Taliban. And in order to kill, you know, wage the CIA drone war, they had to make an agreement with the Pakistanis that they would help them wage this war against their problem. Uh, the uh, the Pakistani Taliban, the Tariqi Taliban. And so they killed like 80,000 people in this horrible war. Were they in invaded their tribal territories, which are called the autonomous zone and all this kind of stuff up there, the federally administered tribal territories. And they just killed all of these people. And in fact, this is what partially led to the rise of the Islamic State in Afghanistan, because the refugees of the Pakistani Taliban then went to Afghanistan for safe haven, where later... They created a group declaring themselves loyal to the Islamic State, which is one of the excuses that we have to stay in Afghanistan now. It's direct blowback from Obama's war in 10. Then you look at the war on terrorism in Yemen. I'll just make this really brief. In order to wage the war on terrorism in Yemen, in beginning in 2009, the CIA drone war, Air Force drone war there, they ended up making compromises with the government that led to further war throughout the country, led to revolution when the Arab Spring came, led to a series of events that put, starting at 20 foot, uh, 50, when Obama put America directly on the side of Al-Qaeda, where he and now Donald Trump have kept us for five years fighting against the almost five years, two months shy of fighting against Al-Qaeda's worst enemies, the Houthis, and oftentimes directly flying as air cover for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula's forces. And these are the guys that attacked the USS Cole and tried to blow up the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009 and did the Charlie Hebdo attack. They're real Bin Ladenite terrorists. And we're fighting for them now because of the consequences of the war against them starting in 2009, as insane as that sounds. So what I want to hear from Tulsi Gabbard is forget all of this, not just forget fighting for terrorists and not just forget these regime change wars, but no more war on terrorism either. We don't need to do this. We're killing innocent people. We're making everything worse. And after all, she's wrong that the war on terrorism begins with their perverted religion, which makes them attack our innocence and beauty. It's just not true. It's Bill Clinton's policies that made them attack us on September 11th. And it's the policies of George Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump that have made everything nothing but worse in the entire time since then. And that's just the reality of it. So the correct answer is call the whole thing off. And, you know, she even put out this video where she's blaming Wahhabis which is, you know, a pretty right-wing reactionary goofball form of Islam that you wouldn't agree with if you knew much about it, I'm sure. And yet she says, well, yeah, this is the problem. People believe in Wahhabism and then they go to war against us. And there's your, you know, one-two connection here and how this works is just completely false. And then she elaborates, she says, listen, forget fighting for these guys and forget the regime change wars, but we still have bin Ladenite groups, dangerous bin Ladenite groups in the Idlib province in Syria, which is correct. Uh, Al-Qaeda forces in Yemen, Uh uh-huh. And then she says, Somalia, well, Al-Shabaab is not really Al-Qaeda. They've taken Al-Qaeda money, you know, Saudi money before, and they've probably pledged their loyalty and what have you. But they're an indigenous militia force and pseudo shadow government type of an organization there. They're not international bin Ladenite terrorists. No. Uh, so she's already stretching, right? She's on her third group, she names, and she's already stretching. And I forget if she names Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which just is North Africa there or not. I think she does. She's says Libya. So she goes, well, there's, there have been Ladenite groups in Syria. And then there's, there's a group there in Yemen and in Somalia and Libya. And then she goes, there are hundreds of these groups spread all throughout the Middle East and Africa. Well, wrong. I mean, that's completely crazy. What the hell is she talking about? She just ticked off four 
And even there, right. she was leaning over backwards, trying to expand definitions and overgeneralize so she could include the Somali insurgency. But now there's hundreds of groups one sentence later. And so essentially she's writing herself a writ for unending war. Sure. And in fact, she's undermining the entire anti-war message that this whole thing is wrong. You know, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan backed these guys. Bush and Clinton turned them against us. Bush Jr., Obama and Trump have quintupled the disaster in all the directions. What's so hard about that? History didn't begin on September 11th. Give me a break. What's so hard about blaming Bill Clinton for things? Did you see the new pictures of him riding on the Lolita Express with his arm around Epstein's girlfriend? No, I haven't, but I yeah. would like so to in other words, more. Yeah, this guy is the lowest scumbag in the world, and we all already knew that since we first met him in 1992, right? I mean, give me a break. What's wrong with just blaming him? It's true. You know, that's funny. Guilty. People still like him. That's why I find yeah, so well, strange. It's like he has good PR or something, but I mean, he's like an open rapist guy. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? It's really what bad. What is there to like about him? Um, yeah. I find it astounding that people still support the Clintons at all. Um, but what do you think about, is Trump really the biggest drone bomber though? Because they say that he has outpaced uh, Obama in drone bombings and how would they stack up? As much time. So I don't think in total, um, and I don't know, it depends on whether they're including the war against the Islamic State or not, um, because, you know, Trump came into office essentially at the height of that. And so um, if if that gets counted in there, then that would be, um, that would kind of skew the results. But overall, you know, drone wars against these small stateless groups in places like Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia, the pace is higher. Yes, he is essentially lowered the standard um, for when to pull the trigger and has uh, devolved the authority over when to pull the trigger lower down the chain of command. And so that has led to an increase, and especially in Afghanistan, Tatiana, they're killing tens of thousands of people. No, he came in, and I write about this in my book, he came in and they were trying to force him, the Pentagon was trying to force him to escalate immediately. And he was like, no, and he bucked. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about Donald Trump, it's all true, but he saw through the Afghan war and just thought that it was completely stupid and wrong way back. In fact, we all know how much he hated Barack Obama, but he took Obama's side on Twitter, but still, he said the generals are wrong. Obama wants to draw down in Afghanistan. That is what's right. Bring them home, save the money, make America great again. Back in 2013 or whatever it was, because he hated the Afghan war more than Obama even, at least on that day. And he came into power and immediately the generals tried to roll him. They immediately gave him the Obama treatment of just full court press. You better do what we say. And it only made him mad. And he reacted against it and he refused to go along with their demands for escalation until August, at which point he completely rolled over and escalated and gave him 10,000 more troops and a blank check to escalate the air war, especially the drone war, but drones and planes uh, to great degrees. I don't know, you know, percentages, but thousands and thousands. Thousands and thousands of people are being killed in their strikes. And they're calling out using F-35s and F-22s and B-1 bombers to hit mud huts that are supposedly opium laboratories, you know, that are just, you know, some compound on the ground. The guys bombing have no idea whether somebody is manufacturing heroin somewhere. And of course, if you bombed every Even single if they heroin were. lab in the country, I'm sorry. Even if they were manufacturing heroin, are we supposed sure. to just bomb them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what good is that supposed to do at all? Yeah, Jesus. it's completely crazy. Um, and then, but also, um, you know, in Yemen, let me tell you about Yemen again, uh, just for a second here. Uh, five years ago, okay, in January of 2015, the Houthis, this tribe of Shiites out of the north, were seizing power in the capital city of Sanaa in alliance with the former president that Hillary had overthrown, but who wanted his power back. And at that time, the Americans were working with the Houthis to kill Al-Qaeda guys. Again, the Al-Qaeda are as radical as you could get of, you know, Sunni uh, Salafist type um, or Wahhabist type um, Muslims who absolutely hate and detest Shia. And so these guys are, you know, absolutely at odds here. And so uh, we have it reported in the Wall Street Journal and in Al Monitor that uh, very well reported that the Obama government or the military under Obama 
was working with the Houthis to target and kill Al Qaeda guys. And they said it was working. It's pretty good. We give them some intel and they bring us back a scalp. This kind of thing. I'm not saying that's fine, but I'm saying that is what it is because here's the point. Just two months later, in March of 2015, Obama turned right around and stabbed the Houthis in the back in order to take Saudi and UAE and Al Qaeda's side against them. And the war after five years has accomplished none of their goals. And How the Houthis bad. still control the capital. I'm sorry. How well, how mad, like, okay, so if I was an army guy or military guy or girl or whatever, I would be furious with this leadership and I don't know why are they still there? I mean, are they people like going to leave? Cause that just seems completely pointless. I mean, I know that there's a horrible suicide issue with veterans when they come home, but the people that are there, I mean, this just seems so hopeless. Every time you come on the show, I'm just overwhelmed. I sound like a dope cause I don't even know what to suggest as a solution for this massive, massive bloodshed. So why are they still there? Like, why do the troops just keep keep staying there? I mean, well, why don't they just leave? Can't they? I mean, they're, they're I mean, what no it jobs. is, honestly, it's the division of responsibility, right? If you're a soldier, your job is to get some and let somebody else worry about who it is that you're targeting. Your job is to be a good soldier and and carry out your elected democratic government's will. And so... The people delivering the firepower to the target are not the ones choosing the target. And so it's kind of nobody's fault. It's just like the guys that ended up in Guantanamo. The guys that were arresting people in random sweeps or whoever was turned, you know, kidnapped and turned in for a bounty, they would say, well, look, I'm just some GI out in the field. I don't know who these guys are. I'm just going to put them on the plane and let somebody else figure it out. But then the people on the other end of that flight are going, wow, they brought me a guy. He must be guilty of something or else they wouldn't have put him on the plane. And so the presumption is already that the guy's done something. When the guy that put him on the plane doesn't presume anything, he just knows that this is one of the guys that he arrested. And he's not judging the issue. He doesn't know or care. He figures that's somebody else's problem. And so then the guy who receives him is like slaps a big guilty sign on his back and puts him on the plane to Guantanamo. He gets to Guantanamo and they torture him for nine weeks. But he's just some sheep herder or just some Taliban propagandist or some kind of nobody but it's because there's this there's no accountability and it's all kind of ad hoc procedures and um you know it's close enough for government work <laughs> i think i don't know you know there's a song called universal soldier it's an old um anti-war song and i was thinking from time to time of covering it because it's an interesting song but i don't really like that it blames the soldier because to a certain extent, he's just following orders. But I don't know, man. It's, it's, uh, I feel like these people should also take some responsibility for their actions as well. Uh, it's it's I very, mean, very disappointing. Um, I sure knew better. I mean, I, they probably would have kicked me right out the door anyway because I'm just some twerp. But uh, either way, I certainly knew better than to join the military when I was 17 and 18 years old. I didn't want to go fight for Bill Clinton's New World Order or whatever it was. But then again, at the same time, I got to admit, I, I had very privileged access to left-wing anarcho-communists who taught me all about the history of the CIA and all this stuff. Like when I was really young, uh, I had a great leg up on what criminals my government was. Uh, far, you know, way above and beyond what other high school kids ever got a chance to learn. And so, you know, I can't blame a 17 or an 18 year old. The idea is that, you know, the adults figure this stuff out. They vote in these elections, they choose good leaders and the good leaders are accountable. And so they only make good decisions and they write history exactly how it had to be written. And, and my job is to get out there and it's a much smaller, you know, job description kind of, you know what I mean? It's a, uh, my job is to carry this rifle and to march from here to there or to you know, go on this mission and target this guy. More importantly to these guys, my my mission is to go out there and protect my guys, right? My band of brothers out here, you know, if, if Jimmy's going, I'm going. And so it's a different set of priorities, you know, it's, um, but, and, and not only that, and I hear this a lot too, and maybe I'm passing out too big of a permission slip here. I don't know, but who the hell am I anyway? But I do hear from these guys and I know this too, is my same culture too, that I'm from that, you know, if your dad and your coach and your minister and all your friends' dads and everybody know that, hell yeah, joining the army is great. Congratulations, son. That's the right thing to do. Everybody knows that. That's the consensus around here. Is that's what makes a man into a man and all this. If you're an 18-year-old kid and that's the consensus, then psh, what? there's no objection. What's the objection? You're fighting for your country. It's not like you're just a murderer. You're a soldier. You're, you're fighting to do good and to help people. 
And Lord knows George Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump wouldn't use you to do the wrong thing. Why, that would be dishonorable, right? Like all this is baked in. All this is just built in to the culture. And so, and you know what? The most important part of this probably, football. I mean, I grew up as a kid watching football with my dad every weekend and whatever during the seasons. And uh, aim high Air Force and be all you can be in the U.S. Army and all that stuff. It's a matter of, uh, and nowadays it's way worse with, you know, all of the propaganda, all the flags and all the signs and all the salutes and all the whatever. It's a way of, it's an incredibly sophisticated and successful propaganda campaign to just normalize all of this, that essentially all red-blooded men who like football know that the army is great, good old army. And it's just built into the thing. And it and it's beyond question unless you really stop and question it, in which case you can go pretty far. But if you don't, that's a lot to ask a, a young person to see through. And what I hear all the time is guys who come home and say, yeah, now that I'm home, I kind of looked into it <laughs> and I started listening to your show. And I think now I recognize my mistake, but it's, you know, I don't know. And you do have some conscientious objectors too, figure it out while they're still in. A lot of times heroically leave the service with just a year or two before retirement or something and just say, no way, I'm not doing this. So yeah. I know. I think that there's definitely a lot of people that regret going in there and, you know, you you paint a a good picture on how it can happen without automatically assuming that these people are just soulless or something like that. Um, You know, Colonel Hackworth, let me, let me tell you real quick about Colonel Hackworth. He was the most decorated officer in the Vietnam war. And then when he came home, he essentially fought a class war for the enlisted men against the officers. And the way he always phrased it was the enlisted men are the people. They're citizen soldiers, whether it's a volunteer army or a draft army, either way. They are American, almost civilians in uniform. They are us. They are people. The officers, they're the government. They are the enemy. They are the adversary. And if it was up to them, they would waste the life of every last soldier without blinking an eye. They don't give a damn. And that was why Hackworth was here, was to fight for the weak end of the scale, the mass of the enlisted men and their rights and their priorities against the officers who would sacrifice them, you know, for the cost of uh, Dr. Pepper, whatever. So, but anyway, um, so uh, I think that's kind of informs the way I look at it a lot. You know, I'm a skateboarder. I've grown up a, around a lot of working class guys who've been in and out of the army, their parents in and out of the army. My parents aren't military people. My grandfather was, but uh, you know, uh, I'm, I've been around enough of that culture where, you know, these are all good people, man. It's a question of what they're caught up in and what they know and when they find out, you know. Well, I appreciate all that you do to raise awareness about this stuff. Um, Obviously, people are going to want more. So where can people listen to you? What organizations are you currently supporting? And you have the Libertarian Institute. Uh, I think that you're going on the Contra Krugman cruise coming up. So, you know, what's what's on your agenda so people can connect with you? So. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute. That's libertarianinstitute.org. And I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. That's antiwar.com. And uh, I wrote the book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And I host the Scott Horton Show. I've got 5,000 interviews for you in the archives there at scotthorton.org. And you can sign up for the podcast feed. And I do five or 10 interviews a week, almost all on foreign policy stuff for you there. And I'm on the radio in L.A., on Sunday mornings, eight thirty to nine on KPFK ninety point seven FM. Awesome! That's a lot of a uh, lot of places where you can listen, and that's awesome. Uh, you know, guys, don't be intimidated if you don't understand everything that Scott talks about. Uh, the more you listen, the more you will understand. That was something I asked him early on. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks very much for making the time to come on the show, everybody. Please support Scott's work. Uh, thank you to LTV for having us. Uh, you can listen to the Tatiana Show generally on Tuesdays. Uh, at thetatianashow.com. You can also listen to our relationship podcast called Proof of Love at proofoflovecast.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. And thanks to our sponsor, eToro. Bye now. Hey there, it's time for the show. The Tatiana Show. Where you make friends and talk life. And crypto, we gotta think and reflect and use lots of intellect with our hearts when we work together. 
I know that it can be so hard out there Looking all around and saying that life ain't fair So that is why we will fight and stay up late at night Listening to the Tatiana Show Thank you for listening to The Tatiana Show. Please follow us on Twitter at Queen Tatiana or on Facebook and Instagram at Tatiana Moreau's Music. More episodes can be found at thetatianashow.com and make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. What's the point of all this technology without a little love in our lives? Our hosts, Tatiana Moreau's, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz have come together to bring you Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. The Tatiana Show has been brought to you by CryptomediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond.